Welcome into the Paul Kuharski podcast, part of the 440 Sports Network. I'm Paul Kuharski of paulkuharski.com, brought to you by Zen Sports, the best place to place bets if you're in Tennessee. Happy to be with you to talk Titans. Going to cover a couple things and then get into our uh, frequent question and answer session, which I've been enjoying immensely. Good to see a bunch of you jumping in. Retweet to alert your friends, share on Facebook, point them to YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. While you're there, uh, punch subscribe, like, um, and if you're listening later on um, one of the many audio platforms, please do the same. I uh, want to start off talking about Rand Carthon, <clears throat> who's getting good reviews for um, – his media availability the other day with Legereus Sneeds, uh, following Legereus Sneeds media availability. Uh, I talked to him for about 20 minutes at the, at the owners meetings. Uh, I know why it did as well. Um, seems to be opening up somewhat, which is great news. So I resent frankly, that so many people in the media, especially people who are in the media but don't come to press conferences or not in the media level are saying, and I'm talking to uh, Braden Gall and Zach Lyons who just came off the air, uh, and I sent them a, a, a message during their broadcast of a football show, and we joked about it. But they're saying, oh, thank God, Rand Carthon's finally speaking. Uh, it's Gentry etched. Estes and Paul Kuharski must be so relieved they should give Rand a standing ovation. He's finally giving in to their demands that the general manager speak. And then they talk for 20 minutes about the things that Rand Carthon said, a general manager who, in a market like Tennessee, who's renowned for his affable manner, uh, spoke to the media. It's great. It's part of his job and what he should do. And it's been fantastic. I got a lot of stories out of it from, uh, from Orlando and people got more stories out of it from um, his short podius, podium session. Uh, why the fact that reporters want to ask questions of decision makers rather than be left to presume things is a bad thing is, is ridiculous. And then uh, a lot of people, not just those two, but I've heard it from a lot of people. Oh, the, the reporter should be so happy. Rand's finally doing what they want. And then, uh, okay, if, if you don't want us to ask Rand questions, then don't use any of his answers. Shut up. Uh, don't broadcast it live on your shows. How about? I don't want to hear it on your airways. Uh, and then be quiet in terms of anything he said. Don't use it. If you were happy when Rand Carthon was in the background silent, then and you're mocking those of us who wanted to ask him questions and get actual information, then shut up now. And, and don't use what we're producing for you. Your content stealers as it is when you come out and don't ask a question. Uh, so that, that's bullshit. He talked with me openly about <clears throat> a blue chip versus, uh, you know, one blue chip versus two, uh, two quality players um, in the draft, the Sneed trade detailer, details and, and his knee. The other day, talked about the green dot guy, how it could be a rookie inside linebacker, but how it doesn't have to be a linebacker. That's an interesting nugget that wouldn't have been produced, by the way, if he wasn't at a podium answering questions. And delightfully so. Talked about the safety, safety market and how he thinks now the veterans will, uh, will be a post-draft thing. And then he's great at offering texture and uh, and detail, which is why it's so good to have him talking more frequently when he tells a story about the Sneed family um, <clears throat> being shown around the Titans facility and um, going to get a drink for Legereus's young son. And it, just the timing of NFL Network showing uh, a, a key Kansas City playoff game and Sneed coming up to make a big tackle right at the right moment when they happen to be paying attention to what's on the screen. Uh, you know, uh, Rand really comes to life when he gives stories, shares stories like that. Same thing with um, talking about Ridley and last year when they were, when they were talking uh, about DeAndre Hopkins and talking to DeAndre Hopkins and they, they were kind of sorting through a bunch of guys that had worked out together 
and Ridley was in that group and they were hearing that guys, all pro caliber guys, pro bowl caliber guys were stealing tricks and tips and watching very intently the things that Calvin Ridley were doing. And that made a big impression on them that, that Ridley was a guy amongst all of these quality guys uh, who was drawing the attention of his peers. That's a great textured, informative story that now will be something that we probably touch on multiple times with Calvin Ridley and that sticks with Calvin Ridley. That's fantastic to hear that from the general manager. I'm sorry for those of you that, that prefer that he uh, not talk. So kudos to Ryan. I hope he continues to talk. Um, and, and, and the frequency of it uh, increases. If, if he's good like he's been lately, he's a resource for them in telling the team's story. And this team needs to tell its story. It's uh, been a largely uninteresting team. It's been a largely secretive team, too secretive on stuff that didn't necessarily need to be secrets. Um, and it needs to sell PSL to a new stadium that are very expensive. Entice the fans by sharing texture and detail. It's, it's great. Houston Texans are going to be <clears throat> the favorites in the AFC South for – a lot of people by a wide margin. I think if you're picking anybody else, you're really going to be an outlier. And I know it's going to be incredibly annoying to Titans fans. Titans have had a very nice um, off season. We don't know what the draft is going to hold, but it's hard not to look at the free agent class and be excited. Not everybody's going to pan out the way that um, everybody imagines. Not everybody they brought in. It never works that way for teams that are the, you know, wear the crown of, of the free agent, um, gold, silver, and bronze medalists. But the Texans, too, are right up there. I mean, if you look at what they've done on defense, just up front, they've added Hunter and Autry and Fadukasi. I mean, uh, two guys they already had, re-signed Barnett. That, that is going to be a very challenging uh, front. Aziz Al Shair, uh, a heck of a player. Akuda uh, as a corner, who if he gets past some things and and gets into uh, turns more into the kind of player everybody thought he was going to be when he came out, could be a real addition at corner. Take a chance on C.J. Henderson, who could be a real gravy player. And then this week they trade for Stephon Diggs. Look, like Stephon Diggs is not what he was, but he's still a really good receiver adding another guy to the long list I tweeted out this week of the type of guys Legereus Sneed will be covering if the Titans use him to mirror the best receiver on other teams, though you've also got uh, Dell and Collins, um, who are handfuls. That's a heck of a three-pack at receiver for C.J. Stroud. This is a really good, well-rounded football team that caught a lot of attention, caught a lot of attention turned a lot of heads last year and deservingly so with the big turnaround they had. And you could legitimately look at the Houston Texans on paper. We're in April. Everything's on paper right now and say that they could be the second best team in the AFC South going in. And I think there'll be people picking them for the AFC championship game and for the Super Bowl. Uh, No secret. People will be picking for the AFC championship game. I think they will be, you know, for people looking to get away from the Chiefs, the Texans are going to be a Super Bowl pick uh, heading into the season. I know that's going to going to drive a lot of you crazy who uh, hate the Texans as as Titans fans and want to uh, look a different direction in the AFC South, which uh, I, I need to get into soon. Is is this as good um, as good as the division is has been talent wise since when? Uh, I want to go through that and look at it. I see a lot of questions here. Uh, I'm excited about that, and we shall dig in. Thanks for coming. Uh, Hit retweet, share, et cetera, and we will get into some things here. Um, So uh, MB says, I don't rank anyone on paper. I just say the Texans have improved, but we'll see how much. Well, I mean, this is the time of year that 
<clears throat> things line up on paper. What uh, you know, I could say, uh, okay, we won't discuss how the division stacks up until uh, a month into the season when we've seen teams play, and that'd be a really exciting conversation. Texans have improved, and we'll see how much. The Titans have improved, and we'll see how much. All right, everybody, have a good afternoon. Riveting. Uh, Mona Patino says, people forget we helped them win the division by beating the Jacks. Who's forgotten? Like, you win the division, you win the division. Doesn't matter how you win the division. Year before, you helped the Jaguars win the division by losing to the Jaguars. You think everybody runs around saying, hey, you remember in 2022 when the Jaguars won the division, how exactly that went down? You remember when the Titans, um, uh, you know, went to the Super Bowl in 1999? You remember how exactly that went? Down? No. All right, catching up here. So let's see what you've got. Adam says, now that Rand has most of two free agencies under his belt and one draft, what are my thoughts on him as the GM? Do I think he has a bright future? It's still too early to say. We need to see how these guys do. The draft is more important than uh, free agency in terms of building a long-term roster. And this is not all Rand solo. Um you know, Chad Brinker has had a uh, significant role in this, not to take away from Rand, but to to give to Brinker, who was certainly instrumental in the Legereus Sneed uh, deal. But the collaborative effort has been very productive in uh, producing a much better roster and in spending their money. Uh, the one thing that's funny to me is they said, you know, they really did a pivot to get to Ridley. And they really did a pivot to get to Sneed. So what were the plans before Ridley and Sneed when you're talking about um, really the best available receiver and the best available corner at two positions that they were uh, largely desperate to, to get help at, right? I mean, it could have been something on the defensive line. I've heard Reader maybe. Um, you know, I don't, I don't buy that it was an Autry Al Shair thing because that was in a different time frame than most of these. Um, so, no. Logan Grady with the interesting thing. Burks a worse first pick than Farley. Agree? Absolutely not. Burks has played some, and Burks has made some plays. Now, he's not a good first-round pick at this stage by any means, but Farley has done absolutely nothing. You've never seen Farley play well. Burks has had a couple games where he played well. Burks has had a couple plays where he said, whoa, Farley has not had those. Farley's, I, I think, a worse pick by a good margin. Robert says the Texans are going all out until they have to pay Stroud. Well, that's what teams with corner quarterbacks on rookie contracts do. What do you think the Titans are up to? Brad asks, what's the pick if Alt is gone at seven? If Alt is gone at seven, one of the receivers may be there. I think if Neighbors is there, I might take him over Alt. I would take him over Alt. If they're both there, neighbors would be the pick to me at seven. Um, if Alt is gone at seven, um, but you consider all, all three of the receivers, whichever one is there, neighbors number one to me. Um, Fashionu, I think, is is being underrated all of a sudden somehow. I I don't know if you take him at, at seven, a, a, a trade back, even with alt there is more and more attractive to me. Um, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't know what the Titans think, right? What Bill Callahan thinks is the most important thing here. But the more you read and hear from people who know the draft far better than I do and know these college players, the space between alt and Fashionu and Latham 
uh, and some of these other guys is not a massive cavern. So, I mean, if they see alt and a big space and everybody else, then you got to take all. But if they see all bunched with these other guys pretty tightly and you can go from seven to 11 and still get one of those other guys, then you got to go from seven to 11 or 12 or 13 if you can <clears throat> to get a pick that allows you to address not only left tackle uh, in the first three rounds, but left tackle and edge and receiver to me. And if you can just all three of those Thursday and Friday, you're in great shape. I don't think Ed says surprising that plan a was keeping Autry and Shair and pivot to a guy like Ridley. I don't, I don't think that's how it went. I mean, I think that keeping Autry and Al Shair was part of plan a, um, but I don't think losing, I don't think that's a direct correlation. I think there's something else in plan a, something else big in plan a um, that, that came apart that had them shift to Ridley. And, you know, the timing Ridley didn't, couldn't happen until after Wednesday, right? When the, when the timing passed that the, if the Jaguars re-signed him, they'd still lose the third to the Falcons from the trade instead of a second. So his clock didn't really start until Wednesday when everything else started on Monday. So I, 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 I'm pretty convinced that that that's not a direct correlation. I think Sneed's knee, Robert Stutter, stuttered, Stewart, sorry. Any feelings about Sneed's knee after the presser? A lot of folks think it's a problem going forward. Who knows? Well, I, I said um, – on the game this week with Robbie and Rextra that uh, at the owner's meeting, I, I had probably at least six media types, you know, approach me and say, yeah, he's got a real problem with his knee. It's a degenerative condition. Don't know degenerative over what period of time, um, you know, Titans certainly comfortable with it. Rand Carthon told me, you know, important thing is that he plays on Thursday or Sunday or Monday when the Titans have a game. So they're certainly okay with him missing some practice and maintaining it how he needs to maintain it. He said he knows how to handle it, so he didn't deny that there's some kind of long-term maintenance that needs to be done over the course of a season. Um, so, you know, it could be a problem, but, um, you know, I think it, it's a risk they're willing to take. And two or three years of Sneed, um, you know, obviously handled it awfully well last year. So it's a wait and see kind of thing. Brian asks, any idea what kind of scheme Wilson will run on defense? Press, zone, blitz, heavy. It's going to be a lot like the old scheme. Uh, but right now it's going to have to blitz uh, a lot more because they don't have the people up front. So it depends on what they're able to add in terms of uh, edge rushers. Um, and God, you know, the philosophy has been to be able to rush for and cover with numbers. They don't need to cover with numbers now with better corners, adding a woozy and sneed. Um, you should be able to, to solo up on, on good receivers. They need a second safety. Um, you know, maybe may, maybe Simmons. I still like digs. There are three good veteran safeties out there at least. Um, I would expect them to sign one of them after the draft and not draft a safety. I, I expect them to address other positions. Um, but but Brian Callahan said largely that the defense is going to – was successful and can continue to be successful doing largely what it did. So I wouldn't expect dramatic change on defense. LD asks, if I'm making the decision, would I go chalk and draft out alt if they are a trade back if possible? I'm leaning more and more to trading trading back uh, and taking Fashanu or, or Latham. Do I think Farley gets a shot to play this year? I mean, Farley will be in camp because financially it makes sense for them to have Farley in camp. Will Farley play at a level that tells them 
Uh, they could be confident in him as uh, as like the third or fourth outside cornerback. I I doubt it. I think Farley's uh, not a very good cornerback who's broken mentally. Um, so I would not expect uh, I would not expect him to be a contributor. But we'll see. He's also got the same corners coach that he had last year. Um, so we shall see. What was that that just came across? Kyle Van Noy back with the Ravens. Do I think most scouts are pretty confident Alt is can't miss? I mean, I think most scouts are pretty confident that Alt is going to be a good player. Can't miss, like, can't miss at what level? He's going to be a good player. Is he going to be a player that is worth the seventh pick in the draft? Undoubtedly. I, I, yeah, I think most people think he's going to be a good to very good player. Are there going to be players who are better than him? at other positions um, available at seven? Maybe. And are there going to be other left tackles in this draft who wind up being better than all? Absolutely conceivable. Adam says, um, it seems unlikely to him that Alt and Neighbors are both gone at seven. Is it unlikely to me? It's... Uh, I think it's unlikely they're both gone, but I think it's pretty likely that neighbors is gone. I think it's unlikely that neighbors is available at number seven. KJ says trading out of that spot's a no brainer move. As long as you can find a partner. I, I mean, Here's what you have to hope. So somebody's going to come up for a quarterback, right? Because you've got Minnesota, uh, the Raiders, and the Broncos who are all quarterback hungry. But do they come up ahead of you? Do they come up to, to the Chargers at five? Do they come up to six? Um, that's the question. Um, what's a comfortable – what's a position I feel comfortable not drafting? Punter. Punter and kicker. Punter, kicker, long snapper. Feel good about all of those positions. Seriously. I mean, uh, corner, you'd want a depth guy. Safety, I don't want them to draft a safety because they have other priorities and they should sign a veteran safety. Uh, inside linebacker, need. Defensive line, need. Outside linebacker, need. Defensive line, need. Offensive line, obvious need. Could take two. I don't think they will. Um, wide receiver need, tight end need. Running back, I'd be fine if they don't draft one. The third third guy, I like Jonathan Ward, and I think they can can have an undrafted free agent compete there. Did I miss a position? I think a quarterback, no. I mean, I think they need a, a very smart inside linebacker who could play three downs to go next to uh, Kenneth Mert at linebacker. And I, I think they need uh, an outside linebacker who can, can play a lot of downs and be, um, be – Danico Autry would be ideal. You know, Darius Robinson from Missouri is seen as a Danico Autry replacement. He'd be a great guy. You know, that's why if you could get yourself three picks in the first three rounds, Darius Robinson's a guy that could be in play probably in the second round. Um, Braswell from Alabama is a, is a good um, outside linebacker type that could really help them. If, if, if they traded down, you know, I've been playing with the trade down like to, uh, to 18 with Cincinnati. I mean, if you look at what's there then and you wanted to wait uh, for Morgan or Paul as your offensive lineman till 38 or 44 conceivably, and you're at 18, you look at what the strength is there. Latu from UCLA might be the best pick at 18. 
Chop Robinson's another guy. That, those are the four kind of edge rusher types who I think could be really uh, big time players for the Titans. Shane asks, what player on the roster do I think has the highest chance to be traded before the deadline? So we're talking about like uh, Halloween or early November. Who do I think could be traded? I mean, uh, that's kind of a silly question. No offense. But to look that far out, uh, have no idea how they're playing, what they're doing, um, who's good, who's not. I mean, no idea. Williams asking about Higgins. I have no interest in Higgins. I didn't have big interest in Higgins before Ridley. They need a young receiver now. They, at certain positions, they need to get young. They need a young cornerback now. They need a young receiver now. Guys who have six years ahead of them, eight years ahead of them, ideal. If the right side of the line comes from in-house, KJ says, Duncan, Raiden's NPF, Brunskill, how do I see route, right guard and right tackle shaking out? Well, I think Brunskill is probably the right guard with the outside chance for Charles. Um, uh, well, you know, Raiden's there too. So Raiden's, Brunskill, Charles competing for right guard. With Brunskill as the favorite, and and uh, but but maybe Raidens, um, and right tackle is uh, you know right now it's between Nicholas Petit Frere and um, and Jalen Duncan. I mean, I think in a lot of ways Nicholas Petit Frere. I I know he didn't have a great deal of uh, dog in him, and I've heard some conversations about that. Uh, and that is a concern with him. And Duncan has more of it. And I like Duncan's upside. But Nicholas Petit Frere played a reasonably good season as a rookie, uh, as a rookie third round pick. So I, I would think it could be a reasonably good competition. I would, I, I like, I like them, I like Duncan's upside, but I would give NPF uh, an early lead. Uh, and I would think he would go first. I think he would take the the lead first. Caleb Farley in more space. Somebody suggesting turning him into a safety in more space. I think there's more occasion for more bad things to happen. Am I surprised that Tannehill hasn't landed anywhere? Not really. I mean, I think he's in a good situation to wait for somebody to get hurt now. When somebody gets hurt. Um, he could be a major solution. I am brought to you by Zen Sports. I always hold up my trusty coaster here. I'm going to put it right in front of the Rolling Stones. Famous logo. Zen Sports. Go get their app. Get it on your phone and start betting there. Use code TNPAUL to sign up. TNPAUL. Make a bet as little as $10 using that code. You get a free membership to paulkuharski.com for one year. If you don't have that already, that's quite a treat. Um, look, I would bet. I, I think that Saturday in the tournament is going to be not competitive. I know uh, a lot of people rooting for NC State, a lot of SEC people rooting for Alabama. I think everybody's going to be disappointed. I think Purdue covers giving nine and a half. I think UConn covers giving 11 and a half. I just think they're the two best teams by a good margin. Uh, you bet both of those, it's plus 262. You make that bet, and then we set up for a Monday night the matchup that could be, you know, a phenomenal classic, Purdue and UConn, the two best teams in the country. That's how I see it unfolding. But however you see it unfolding, you can go to uh, Zen Sports, Make your bet there and uh, reap your process. Uh, reap, reap your profits. You have a no danger first wager, so you can bet a lot more than the ten bucks. You can bet up to a thousand bucks on a bet that's up to plus five hundred dollars. If you win, throw the confetti over your head. If you lose, you've got the assurance of getting your money back in twenty four hours. 
you've got that money right back and you've uh, you didn't lose anything. So uh, it's a great deal from Zen Sports, a great partner to me. Check them out. It's a great place to uh, make your weekend bets. You can also bet on the Yankees, who are uh, pretty much a sure thing right now, the way they're playing, which delights me. I am uh, about to buy a new used car, which is, speaking of bets, uh, very exciting. Uh, I'm a Honda Accord owner. It's time for new. And uh, I think I'm going to go crazy and get a Honda Accord. Very exciting times in the Kuharski household. Also exciting to go watch my son play middle school baseball today after an excellent hitting lesson tomorrow. Hopefully he'll get some strikes and be able to knock some things out of the park. Let's retweet and uh, remind everybody that we're here in order to uh, not have people say that they missed out or didn't know that we were here in the middle of this excellent conversation. Um, cause we don't want them missing out. I'm not seeing it on the Twitter. Why is it not on the Twitter? Have we seen it on the Twitter? Why are people so hung up on Brock Bowers? We have good tight ends, says Brandon. They just need better coaching. Shouldn't waste picks on luxury choices. I don't know that he's a luxury choice. And I, I think you're probably overrating the tight ends. And Chig may or may not be good. Um, he wasn't very good last year. Josh Wiley, we don't know if he's going to be good or not. And, uh, you know, third guy, I don't even know if West goes on the roster or not. But uh, you could always use better than that. Brock Bowers is an intriguing prospect. Though if you're drafting a first-round tight end, certainly uh, first half of the first-round tight end, he needs to be, um, I think, Physically dominant, and Bowers is 6'3". It, it could be great, but the Titans need to, to complete their work on the perimeter and uh, on the offensive line, and they need to draft a premium position, and tight end is not a premium position. I agree with you that it's a luxury choice for them. It's not a luxury choice for the Jets, I don't feel like, and I think he's going to be a very good player, um, but uh, I I – I don't I don't think he should be in play for the Titans. David Jackson wants to know if I'd take Rome or Alt if I had to make a pick. That's a very tough call. I, I like uh a Denze a lot. Um and again, you know, I, I would in many ways defer to Bill Callahan about what's there later. I, I would in many ways think about trading trading down there but i i might lean uh, stumping me david jackson i really want left tackle fixed if they could fix left tackle getting rome at seven then I, I i'd take rome but if alt is what they need to fix left tackle then i'm taking alt uh, so that's not much of an answer. Where was Panda ranked when we took him that high? Bryn wants to know. Ranked by who? I mean, uh, we've got a question here about draft value. I'm going to uh, put a good calculator. This is a very good calculator from Chase Stewart that I've uh, hopefully will send there. I think I sent it. Uh, I would use that calculator to draft value, uh, to, to look at draft value. And then um, where's DFDT? And this is a very good draft tech has uh, translated the Jimmy Johnson chart into this year's draft. So it covers the um, compensatory selections and all of that. And I highly recommend using that chart. Um, so I play with the combination of those two things when I'm playing around with, uh, with that. 
I don't need HLP hitting. Somebody suggesting a hitting coach for baseball. I've, I've got my guy, Chris Riley. Simon loves him and he's fantastic. Somebody's asking me if I had one con only one concert to go to Springsteen or the Rolling Stones. I've seen the Rolling Stones three times. I think I've seen Springsteen 20 something times. If those are my choices, I'll go see Springsteen. Um, a night at Springsteen concert is like one of my favorite things. KJ says, I figured they were drafting the other safety is why they haven't signed a veteran yet. Why they haven't signed a veteran yet is because the price for the veterans is uh, too expensive. And, um, you know, I, I, those guys are entitled to wait and see what the market does. But what the market's going to do is give a good share of teams who want a safety a chance to draft a safety. And then there are fewer teams competing for the veteran safeties. Um, and less demand means, you know, uh, supply and demand dictates that the, the price isn't going to go up for those veteran safeties after, after teams fill out in the draft. Brian says he loved hearing Callahan say Key is a rotational pass rusher, not like last year. Well, I didn't have a lot of alternatives to him last year either. Who did you want in instead of him? Weaver, Murphy, both not good either. And those are the alternatives now. So it's great to say he's a rotational pass rusher right now. They don't have anybody to put in. Um, so they, they, they have to have an alternative before they can make him uh, situational. Um, pass rusher. I mean, there's not great talent. Brian is asking with about $30 million left, do you think you sign more free agents or hold on to that money? Few free agents I like. Isaiah Simmons, Tyus Bowser, Taven Bryant, Andreas Pete, Justin Simmons. I, I think, um, I, I think they'll sign a veteran safety in free agency um, and, and maybe an offensive lineman. Those are the two spots that I would look. And, uh, you know, maybe somebody shakes out. I don't know that you're getting a DeAndre Hopkins quality guy, but maybe somebody shakes out later that helps them as well. I do remember that Mike Vrabel said the waiver wire was going to be packed the Monday after the draft, and there were like three or four guys on it who were worth a damn. Does Alt give me a Trevor Penning vibe? He he does not. Um, he does not. Does he give you a Trevor Penning vibe? Logan wants to know if he could bet my money, and uh, my money is unavailable. Derek said Bowers is a game changer for Levis. Well, you know, Washington, the, the little receiver who will be available in the third round, could be a game changer for Levis. Uh, Dunze or Neighbors could certainly be game changers for Levis. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of guys that could be game changers. Joe Alt can be a game changer for Levis. There, there are a lot of guys that could be game changers for Levis. Somebody in here likes Guyton, wants to see a trade back for Guyton. Um, I, you know, I haven't seen anything to, to, uh, in, in, I haven't investigated Guyton in a high level. I know a lot of people like him. I think he's in that, that bunch of guys after Alt and Fashionu who are intriguing. Um, they're taking a left tackle in the first two picks here. I, I, can't see a scenario where they do not. Um, is my Springsteen autograph one of my favorite things? It certainly is. The book has a prominent place in the room, thanks to you. 
Rank the AFC South quarterbacks for Sam, please. I mean, you have to imagine Stroud sustains, but I do think he will dip. And uh, and Trevor Lawrence has not really delivered, though I like Trevor Lawrence a lot. So I'm going to go Stroud, Lawrence. I'm not a Richardson guy, and he hasn't played yet. So I'm going to go Levis, Richardson. Derek says, looking back, I didn't realize how much Vrabel deserved all the grilling you gave him. And now, Derek, there's a second part to that. Continue. I lo I'll look for your second comment. And now. Uh, David Jackson continues here with good questions. How long do I think it takes for the team to integrate all these new additions? Potential to start the season slow but finish stronger. I mean, that's a great question. Um, and Chad Brinker but raised that very thing, you know, in the story I did that was spurred by the All-22, which David Jackson's a part of, uh, where uh, I asked both – Brinker and Carthon, like what their expectations are for this team this season. And Brinker, you know, talked with hope, but raised this very thing, new coaching staff, you know, new conditioning stuff and a roster that's going to have so much newness to it. How much time does it take for that stuff to come together? You know? We've seen it happen fast. You'd like to think it can happen fast, but it's not unreasonable to think also that it could take some time to gel. Um, and, you know, things come together at different paces, in different places, under different circumstances and the like. And um, I think that'll be, David, one of the biggest stories of, of this whole deal is um, how long does it take? for guys to get to know each other, to feel comfortable together. Um, you know, the practice uh, stuff is is limited in a way that's not favorable um, in terms of getting, you know, the max out of that. And um, there are going to be times that require patience. And I, I think uh, management understands that and the coaches understand that and, you know, they're going to need the fans at, at some times to understand it, who probably aren't going to understand. They're going to look at these big names and say, hey, these guys should come in and, and fix it. But it's not like, um, you know, buying five guys for your baseball lineup and, uh, and, and their ability to immediately change things by stepping into the batter's box or walking into, uh, into, into left field or, or to second base. Um, on defense or in, into the bullpen for that matter. It's just a different deal. And so I think as fans, you know, I would, I would root for speed, but understand that, uh, you know, it might not pan out that way. Um, and I, I think that's a theme to be aware of. What else we got here? Sam liked Herndon's piece yesterday. If you're not a member of the site, you're missing out on that. He kind of wrote, stay at seven, trade from seven, stay at 38, trade from 38. What could and should happen in all of those scenarios? His usual very smart look at stuff like that. Sam likes the idea of moving to the teens and coming out with fashion new and extra picks for their other needs. I do too. And, uh, and Zach wrote today, and I think this is a, a really well-made point, like, and this is why the draft, and, and I think teams do this too, not just draft media. Like the month of April is unnecessary. Um, now, it, you know, your work expands. It's called Parkinson's, uh, Parkinson's Law. Work expands into the time you have to fill it. So if you've got until April 28th or whatever the date is to, to decide what you want to do in the draft, then you will take that time. But if the draft was March 28th, you would get the work done by March 28th. 
And I think most teams would, once they got used to it, rather have the guys for that month in-house, beginning to train, beginning to learn the playbook and all of that stuff. And it would be healthier. And you wouldn't sit and reconsider and reconsider and reconsider. Now, draft media has somehow taken Olu Fashionu and turned him into, uh, as, as Zach wrote, you know, like OL4 slash 5 when he was OL1 and uh, LT1 and, you know, maybe shifted to LT2. But, you know, small hands alone are not enough to, to drop them that far. And I talked to uh, Roos and Lawan and Hopkins and Kevin Mawai. And three out of four of them said small hands, absolutely not a factor in, in the game. Only Brad Hopkins thought it was a thing. The other three of them said not an issue at all. And certainly not the sort of issue that should, should be moving him as far as he seems to have moved in the draft industrial complex. Um, so, uh, and, you know, has a lot of really, really good traits, particularly as a pass blocker. So, I think it's it's crazy, and I I think that extra month gives people too much time to to find ways to break guys down who they like. Hey, we like this guy. Now let's spend a month finding reasons not to like this guy. I'm not saying that's what happened with him, but that happens with a lot of people, and it, it's not. I don't think it's a healthy part of the process. Kane wants to know who would be my guess for the most likely trade back partner for the Titans. I don't know. Minnesota put something out this week that, you know, maybe they're okay with Darnold this year and waiting on a quarterback till next year. Is that posturing? I mean, it seems like Minnesota, you know, at 11, then it's the Raiders at 12 and the Broncos at 13. If I have that right. Um, it's one of those three coming up for, a, for a quarterback. Uh, and you just got to hope they don't go, ahead of you uh, that that's the big issue beard game 100 percent. so i haven't i am doing better on the neck here i do have some vicious itch though run the wishbone and pound the clock tremaine wants for those of you that can't see the beard i know that uh that 15 seconds was fascinating Alex asks, do I think with Sneed and Cheeto that McCreary so, so, solely plays in the slot? How do I think the rotation works out? Yeah. I mean, McCreary is the slot corner. I, I'm sure they change it up once in a while to throw somebody off. But I thought McCreary did quite well in the, in the nickel last year. Uh, I think he's one of the few young guys on this team that's showed steady progress. Um, and, uh, you know, I think he'll hugely benefit from being with two veterans of that quality. Um, I would think that, uh, Sneed will track the best receiver on the other team, though Callahan mentioned to me that, that, uh, Cheeto has done that as well. Um, and, and look, you know, maybe there, there's some situations where they think, uh, they're better off staying left and right in a game or Cheeto has a favorable matchup and they, they do it that way. But I, I think Snead, the reason you go get a guy like Snead is because of what Snead did in Kansas city and what Snead did in Kansas city, as Andy Reid told me in that snippet that I sent out was, you know, who's the best receiver. He's got the best receiver. Jim, I appreciate the compliment. Uh, how do I think Ridley will fit in? I mean, I think when Ridley's at top of his game, Ridley's really good. I've, I've said multiple times, I think Ridley getting used to being a, a very highly paid uh, guy who's looked at as a, as a, you know, superstar needs to put up superstar numbers. Um, that's the concern. The, the concern with me for Ridley is off the field stuff. And if he can manage that stuff, I expect very big, uh, very big things from him. We'll go a few more minutes here and join the conversation. Oh, Banksy tells me a damn score that I don't want to see yet.
I do. Uh, Hibbs is asking me about Darius Robinson, and I, I do like him. Is the combine becoming obsolete now that every game is on TV? Somewhere there's film and tape on everybody. Move that draft earlier. The combine's not obsolete because they need the physical, the physicals. Um, and so the combine, there, there always needs to be a gathering of the prospects for people to get them, uh, tug on them, um, you know, t- test them out physically um, and, and do all of that. I do. I, I love the idea of what Ma- Marvin Harrison Jr. said um, in terms of, you know, not going to train to to run and all that stuff, train to be a football player. It would be great if we got to a point, I think, where, where you know, everybody united and said that, you know, look at the tape, the tape, the tape is uh, is my resume, not my 40 here, not my broad jump and all of that. Cause I think that stuff is, is silly. Um, but I don't know, you know, I, and I think that's probably far away, but I do think the bigger deal the league tries to make out of the combine, the more pushback there will be from the guys who make a particular combine, a bigger TV show. So the five biggest guys at next year's combine will be less inclined to, make the TV show something you want to watch. Uh, They get nothing out of it except some risk of straining a hamstring or a groin or something that sets back their process. And uh, they can't really hurt their draft position by not participating. DB is in Hawaii. And we are all jealous. Kane wants to know if I think tight end is a priority in the draft or just rolling with chicken. Wiley. I think they'd love to have a tight end. I just think you can't get everything. So, you know, if, if a great one is there and happens to fall in their lap and they take him above, uh, I don't know, a corner, um, or something like that, it's possible, but I I don't know that they can prioritize it based on all the other things that they need. Yeah, there are no June 1st cuts coming on this team, Jennifer. Um, And you can make a June 1st cut now and just designate it as a June 1st cut. So if they had somebody like that, they wouldn't necessarily wait. IR Hoshi. Wants me to go cover a different team. It's such a dumb, regular question I got. Yeah, because you don't like me, I'm going to pick up and take my 25 years of experience on this team and go start from scratch somewhere else, despite the fact that I'm making a great living covering this team with people who want to hear candid assessments about it. Take your blankie and go somewhere else. Who's my number one receiver? Who do I think fits the Titans scheme the best? I, I mean, I think Neighbors is the guy that fits the the Titans the best. You know, he's just got that explosiveness that would go very nicely with uh, with Will Levis's arm. Um, and so it, it's hard not to like him. But any of those three guys would fit in beautifully here. Kane Martin says he's hoping for three or four primetime games. You better re- reduce your expectation. I mean, I think one or two. They're not, they're not basing uh, primetime games on free agency. Mean Mug says, at what point does Bowers become too good of a value to pass up? Well, you know, probably like 17, 18, 19, it becomes too good of a value to pass up. But it, they, they, still haven't, they still haven't fixed their left tackle problem. They still haven't addressed wide receiver. They still don't have an edge rusher. So he's not too good of a value to pass up there because you still don't, haven't, haven't filled your three primary needs. So to me, there's no point at which it becomes too good of a value to pass up. 
I mean, if if they traded down to 35 and Bowers was on the board at 35, he's too good of a value to pass up. But they still don't have a left tackle or an edge rusher or another receiver. So is he that good of a value to pass up? No, I'd trade to somebody that wanted to draft him. Banks, he says, that Houston will have the same problem introducing so many new players. Well, a lot of their new players on one side of the ball is one thing. Um, on, on defense, a lot more action on defense than on offense, right? Um, and they're coming into a winning team, which is uh, easier than coming into a team that played badly. And they're coming into a team that the coaching staff and the front office have been in place. So there are easier circumstances to bring a whole bunch of new people into, and there are harder circumstances. So one of the Titans' big changes is that the coaching staff is all new. Well, Houston doesn't, doesn't have that. I do not. Christopher Brent is still looking for ways for T. Higgins to join this team with the Titans taking alt at seven and then trading 38 for T Higgins to get three top wide receivers like Houston Higgins is very expensive. They have just given Ridley a very expensive uh, contract and three wide receivers who are old. Uh, I, I don't know where Higgins is, but he's, he's, you know, how many years in uh, this be his fifth. Um, you need a guy who's at the beginning. They need a young receiver. You need a mix of age. So Hopkins is over 30. Ridley's pushing 30. And the other guy needs to be at the beginning. You have to match it up age-wise. John asks about help for Big Jeff and Landry in the draft. Yeah, I mean, they obviously need an inside linebacker and they need a, a, an edge rusher. Ideally, you know, it would be somebody like Archie who could play and and outside backer, but those guys are hard to come by. We've talked a little bit about um, Darius Robinson from Missouri, who's that kind of guy, so he'd be particularly good. But, um, yeah, I mean, edge is one of their three big needs now. Left tackle. Another wide receiver still to get the explosive package of guys that they want. And um, edge. I mean, their pass rush is completely insufficient right now. All right, one or two more and we're out of here. I appreciate all of you coming. Is the green dot linebacker issue as substantial as it seems or is a serviceable linebacker available on day two or three? Well, day two is the second and third round. Those are premium picks still. You can get more than a serviceable inside linebacker on day two, uh, on day two in the second or third round. Fourth round, you can get uh, you know pretty good linebacker. Do I think Burks is on the roster when the season starts? Sure. What are they, they going to do with Burks? You're not gonna, I don't think you're going to cut him. I mean, I think uh, it's just a matter of where he is in the pecking order, and I think he should be low. Last one, Kane, back to Kane. Do I think they roll out new uniforms with a new stadium? No. They changed uniforms not very long ago. You don't want your team to be one of these teams that changes uniforms every couple of years. You know who the teams are that change uniforms every couple of years? Teams that suck and have nothing for their fans to be excited about except going to the pro shop to buy yet another version of their uniform. You want the Titans to be in these uniforms for a long time, build some tradition in them. You don't want your team changing changing garb every, every six years, every eight years, every 10 years. It looks silly. Silly. It's a loser, loser kind of thing. Don't root for that. Appreciate all of you coming. Check out Zen Sports for sure. Do not block the box and be sure to lock your locks. I appreciate each and every one of you. Join Paul Kuharski.